see it. Good for the people. Yes. Amen. Amen. Today was Pentecost Sunday. And most of you know that Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, is when the followers of Jesus Christ were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we kind of consider Pentecost as the birthday of the Spirit filled church. Right. And I'm thankful that God made provisions. You know, we we celebrate Easter as the resurrection, and uh, of course, and during that week, we you know, we remember Christ died and dying on the cross for us, and we do that every Sunday when we take uh, uh, every Sunday that we take a communion. But you know, the purpose of Christ dying on the cross, and the fact that He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave is that so we all could experience our own personal Pentecost. If you recall, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, communion was broken between man and God. And the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is the restoration of that communion. When you have the Holy Ghost, you have communion with God. The Spirit of the living God lives within you. And on this title slide here, it says, Acts 1-8, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And that word power comes from the Greek of dudamos, which is the same word we get dynamite from. So it's, it's a dynamic power. It's not just a title, you know, like, like you know, a king has power, you know, authority. And, that, and yes, uh, you know, there are certain authorities that come upon you by receiving the Holy Ghost. And, and one of the things that Jesus said, if you pray in my name, it shall be done. You know, maybe not in the way we always think or want, but God does answer your prayers. So God does give us a certain amount of authority that comes with our relationship with him. But this power that he's talking about is a power to live holy. And I'm, I'm so glad that Mark taught the lesson he did this morning because that's what the very thing we're talking about is, is the, the power of, of uh, the Holy Ghost in our lives and, and uh, how he can help us to live holy lives. And uh, I'm going to entitle my lesson this morning, Pentecost, A Promise Made and a Promise Kept. And uh, you'll understand that title a little bit later on. But I thought about this lesson this morning, and I thought, well, probably what I should do is start out and explain what exactly Pentecost is. And in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, God gave seven feasts that he told Moses that he wanted his people to observe yearly from, from that point forward. Now, some of these feasts... Uh, or we're very familiar with, and I do notice the first one on there is the Passover. And most of you are familiar with Passover. And after Passover, for seven days, they were not allowed to have any bread with yeast or leavening, age, uh, leavening agent. It was on, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And three days after Passover was the Feast of the First Fruits. And uh, of course, the, these these feasts were these first four feasts were spring holidays, so they, uh, they would start planting their crops, and the very first little tiny shoots that would come out of the ground, then uh, God wanted them to take that and wave it before him as, a, as an offering, as a, uh, as a uh, celebration of the harvest to come. And so that was the waving of the first fruits. Then 50 days after the, uh, the Feast of the First Fruits is the Feast of Pentecost, and the uh, the Jewish people referred to as the, the Feast of Weeks. And then after Pentecost, you had your harvest season, the, the summer season. And then in the fall, they would have three more feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, and then the King James, it talks about the memorial blowing of the trumpets. Now, they're not trumpets like we think of, you know, they're, they're the ram's horns, the shofars that the, the Jewish people blow, the, so you have the memorial blowing of the trumpets, then the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur on the calendars, and then the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now you notice at the bottom of this uh, slide here, it talks about the first four uh, feasts were symbolic for us Christians because they were fulfilled 
when Jesus came. Of course, we know that Jesus Christ was the perfect Passover lamb. And, and then the days of unleavened bread were the no leveling. They, uh, scholars tell us that's symbolic of, of, of Christ's uh, burial. And then the, the, the waving of the first fruits. Jesus Christ is the first fruit from all who, who will be resurrected from the dead. He wrote, because he arose, we know that, that as Christians that we can also experience our own uh, resurrection into eternal life. And then 50 days after Christ resurrected from the grave, you know, he told his disciples to wait and to tear into Jerusalem. And the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the, the, the Spirit of God was outpoured. And so that began to mark the beginning of the church age. And so the summer season, what's going on in the summer? There's plants and, uh, being planted, seeds, and, and uh, you know, things are being uh, cultivated and, and uh, fertilized and taken care of so that we can have a harvest. Of course, different crops come in and are harvested at different times. But when the fall comes, the harvest is over. And, it's, and it's, when you look at those fall holidays, you've got the Feast of Trumpets. What's the next thing on the Christian's calendar? It's when the, the, Ark of the, you know, the archangel shall come and, the, and the, the trump of God shall be blown. We talk about the rapture of the church. So the rapture of church will at the end of the harvest season, the church age, and then God will once again turn his focus back on the Jewish people. And then following the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the... And, and the on that feast day, the God told the Jewish people that they were to afflict themselves. And we know that the, the tribulation time will be a, 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 a time of deep trial for the Jewish people because all the world will turn against them. And, all, and I'm not going to get into prophecy, but that, that a day of atonement is the, 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 the turning of God's people's hearts back to him. That's when, when, when the, the, the Jewish people once again... Uh, uh, turn their, their their hearts to God and 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 be a uh, you know the salvation will come to the Jews, and then after the Day of Atonement is the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles they would actually set up little tent structures out in the uh, streets and on the sidewalks, and they, everybody would move out of their houses and they would move. And of course, to the Jewish culture, that they're celebrating the time that that the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness and lived in tents. But the, the Feast of Tabernacle was a joyous time where everybody shared you know, the, their, their harvest and, and they gave gifts to each other and so forth. And, and the, the Feast of the Tabernacles is symbolic of the Millennial Kingdom when, when the perfect state of all things will come. Now to kind of just to show you a different slide here, I know this is a little bit small. But uh, someone did a like a, a circular calendar showing the the different feasts, and uh, starting off, off to the left, you'll see uh, Passover, which the Jewish people call Pesach, the Days of Unleavened Bread, and the first fruits of Spring Feast. The Feast of Weeks is is a Shavuot in in uh, in uh, Hebrew. That's the Feast of Pentecost, and then toward the uh, end of the year, the fall. Uh, holidays, the memorial blowing of trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah. Now, the Jewish people have two New Year's. They've got a New Year's in the spring, which is their ceremonial New Year. And uh, if you remember, God said this will be the first month of the year for you, and then that, uh, that month they would have Passover. But but on their, their civil year, their, the, the, the calendar they go by, Rosh Hashanah marks the New Year's for them. But that's the memorial blowing of trumpets. Then Yom Kippur in the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and as you can see on here, it talks about Messiah comes as a suffering servant. That's what those first four feasts represent. And then the last three feasts represent the Messiah returns as a conquering king. You know, a lot of, a lot of the Jewish people were expecting the Messiah to come as a conquering king when he came the first time. And that's why they rejected Jesus, because... And they, they were expecting someone to conquer the Romans and set up an earthly kingdom. Well, Christ will come and do that, but not on that first coming. And he'll come do that on the second coming. Now someone, I thought this was kind of interesting, someone took a menorah and put those five feasts across there. 
And so you got the, you know, the, the Passover, the unleavened bread, the feast of first fruits. Those Pentecost is, is the middle column. And then the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Tabernacles. But today we're focusing on the Feast of Pentecost. And in Acts 2, 1 through 4, this is what it reads. When the Day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You know, I really do believe for, for God to be able to work in any church, there's got to be a spirit of unity. There's got to be a one mind and one accord. We have to be on the same page, folks. We have to have a, a, a bond between us. And God can work in the midst of that kind of atmosphere. And they were, you know, the Bible in, in the end of the book of Luke, it says they were continually in the temple worshiping and praising God. And that's another thing that Paul marks at church is that we need to be worshipers. We need to be willing to give God the sacrifice of praise. We need to give God the honor that's due his name. And I think when you have those two things, a church that worships and a church that has unity, yes. God's spirit Amen. can move. God's spirit can influence. God's spirit can come upon us. And so they were in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And remember, the Scripture says that ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost came upon them. These men spoke in foreign tongues because God gave them that ability. And we were talking about this morning about, about holiness. It's not something that we do. It's not something that it comes to, uh, you know, a lot of self-discipline and mental focusing and so forth. It's being, uh, allowing God's Spirit to have His way in our lives. To be willing to seek after the Spirit and allow the Spirit to have the preeminence in our life. And God will empower us. God will... You know, you, a lot of people say, well, I can't witness. I can't, you know, talk in front of people. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Just like Moses. I can't do this. Right. You know? God said, who made the lips? That's right. You know? You know, a lot, of, a lot of things that you think you can't do. Yeah, you probably can't in yourself. But God will give you power. God will yeah. enable you. God gave yeah. them the utterance. Now, I want to back up a little bit. We, we talked about the day of Pentecost, but, you know, there was a promise made a long time ago. Excuse me just a moment. It's allergy, allergy season. I'm going to share something that I, I thought was kind of interesting. Numbers 11, 29. I'll just read this portion of Scripture here. It says, So Moses went out and told the people, what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. So, you know, here's Moses. He's been anointed to lead the children of Israel. He's got the spirit of God resting upon him. God talks to him face to face in the, uh, the, in the doorway of the, of the tabernacle. And the spirit gets upon Moses you know, Moses is getting tired. He's got all this responsibility. He's got all, and all these people are coming to him wanting answers and so forth. So God tells him to appoint seventy elders that, to, to be, uh, you know, uh, in administration underneath him. So he gathers them together, and the Spirit rests upon them, and they prophesied, but did not do so again. In other words, here again, the Lord came upon them, and the word prophecy means God enables them to speak. And it could be a number of things. And we don't always think of prophecy as foretelling the future. But, but anything, any oracle of God, any thought that God has that, you know, a, a prophet is someone who allows God to speak through them. So these men all prophesy. Verse 26 says, however, two men, whose names was Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp for one reason or another, maybe they didn't get the memo. Ever been in the office setting? I didn't get that memo. <laughs> so these two guys, you know, you're supposed to send me. They're on the list to be the elders, but for some one reason or another, they didn't show up to, 
to be anointed by the Lord. And it's kind of interesting what happens. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit arrested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. So here's these two guys, you know, God's spirit moving on there, prophesying. Verse 27, a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. <laughs> Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been with Moses, Moses' aide, says, he spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. My God, they're talking, you know, they're prophesying in the camp. <laughs> I like what Moses said. And Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake I live? Are you worried about my position as a Lord? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. You know, Moses understood something. You know, if these people had what I had, I have, there'd be a whole lot of less problems in this camp, you know. And, and so he, he said, man, if everybody could have the spirit of God upon them. And later on, God shows Moses how, you know, that, uh, um, not later on, actually it was before this, but uh, God had, on Mount Sinai told them about building the tabernacle and giving them the plans for the, for the, the, the tent and the, the, the fence and the, all the furnishing. But he said an interesting thing, and he said, and I will fill him with the Spirit of God. He was talking about a certain individual. He said, I will fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. In other words, in order to make sure this thing gets accomplished correctly and then everything's done the way I want it, I'm going to put my spirit, uh, uh, his name was uh, Elu, uh, I'm going to put my spirit upon him and he will have wisdom he will have understanding, and he will have knowledge just from having the Spirit of God upon him. God, whenever when God wanted something done, he always used a Spirit-led individual to do it. And it's in another place in the Scriptures, uh, when Saul was just a, a young man and, and, and God had uh, told Samuel, I want you to anoint him as king, you know, or, you know, we know Saul turned out to be a wicked king toward the end of his life, but at the, at the early part, he was a very humble man and didn't think that, that he was worthy to be king. But one of the things that Samuel told him, it says, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. Talking about the, the, there was, he's going to meet a group of young men who were prophets and they were going to be coming down the hill. And, and when you meet up with them, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully on you and you will prophesy with them, and notice this, and you will be changed into a different person. The power of the Holy Spirit, if we allow it to work, will change us. It will give us wisdom, it will give us understanding, it will give us the skills we need to do whatever God wants us to do, and it will change us from the inside out. Now notice... Joel 2, 28, verse 20 through, I'm sorry, Joel 2, 20, verses 28 through 29. Here Joel is making a prophecy. He says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants will I pour out of my spirit in those days, talking about when the new covenant comes, when when God will restore uh, the children of the nation of Israel. You know, right? You know, they they were scattered by the Babylonians. They were you know spread out throughout the, the world. But the, he he prophesied that that one day they would come back to their their home country, and and it was in in those days that the Messiah would come, and. And it said, then it shall come pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. In other words, this experience of just kings that were anointed and, and, and people who had pet special tasks and the prophets, this the spirit that would come upon them in the name, this experience would be for all people, for all flesh. 
Acts 1 through 4 says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Remember, I entitled my lesson uh, a promise uh, made and a promise fulfilled. Uh, in other words, through Joel, there was a promise made that the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. And he said, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me, from me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And this is what the, some of the final words that Jesus had told his disciples. You know, I'm sure they were eager to get about, you know, with the, the, the Great Commission, but Jesus said, you wait. You're not going to be able to do this until you receive the Spirit. You wait, you wait. And so, Acts 1, 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You notice it, says, it doesn't say you ought to be witnesses, or you might be witnesses. It says you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the, the Holy Ghost is God's empowerment in our lives to accomplish his will. We're empowered by the presence of our Savior living within our hearts. A couple more scriptures that talk about this promise. Luke, uh, Luke 24, 49, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed and powered from on high. And that, that's basically what he told him in Acts 1, 8, but this is in Luke 24, 49, just a little bit different wording. John 15, 26, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You know, there, there is a, a, an assurance that we receive when we receive the Spirit of God. You know, and the Bible talks about us crying, Abba, Father. You know, Abba, besides being a rock band in the 70s, you know, Abba in the Aramaic language was it was it was father, but it was a uh, a very personal. It's like saying daddy. In fact, you read a lot of commentators will say say it, our our English equivalent to Abba would be daddy. In other words, it's, it's you don't just call any man daddy, right? You know, it, it's someone that you have a very close relationship with. And so the, it said, the Bible says, by the Spirit. In other words, we, we are adopted. We become the sons of God because of the Spirit that dwells in us. And it will testify of me. Ephesians 1.13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So... The, the, the Holy Ghost is tied to the promise of the Father, which was given to us back in the Old Testament, that there will come a day when all flesh will receive the Spirit of God. Acts 2, 16 through 17. After they received the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, they began to worship God and and they were worshiping God in all kinds of different languages. And at that time, it was just after the Passover season there, and there's still a lot of people in Jerusalem from all over the known world. I mean, both from the Parthian Empire and from the Roman Empire, because the Jews had been scattered all over the world. And so they, uh, you know, a lot of them at least once in their lifetime, they wanted to come to Jerusalem and be able to worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. And so these people have traveled far, and, and here's these group of, of, to them, ignorant Galileans speaking in Parthian, speaking in Cyrenian, speaking in Romans, you know, all, from all over the world. And they're they scratching their head and saying, what in the world's going on? How can this be? Of course, you always have those doubters. Ah, oh, they're just drunk. <laughs> I have to admit that when I was young, I, before I started serving the Lord, I got a drunk, drunk a few times, and I probably babbled a lot of nonsense, but I'm sure I didn't speak Roman or, or Ethiopian or anything else, you know, but, uh, you know, there's always going to be detractors to, to the experience of God, but, 
But here these people are, and, and they, they, the question of the day was, what meaneth this? And so Peter stands up and begins to preach to them. And in Acts 2, 16 through 17, it says, but this is that. In other words, what you're seeing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people being empowered by God. What you're seeing is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so, you know, Peter tells them this is that fulfillment of that prophecy that was made so many centuries before. And, and, and Peter goes on, and uh, I'm not going to take time to go through it, but the rest of uh, Acts chapter 2, he talks about how, how uh, you know, David uh, said he would not allow his soul to be, uh, see corruption. And of course, he said, well, you know, David's here with us today. His suckler is just buried right here in this city. But he was speaking of the Messiah. And, he, and of course, if a Messiah... He's not going to see corruption. That means he has to die. He has to be buried. But, of course, he resurrected before the, the uh, nature could take over and decay his body. And so he explains to them that, that they, with wicked hands, had crucified the Messiah. And, of course, you know, the word of God comes with anointing, and, and that they were pricked in their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do? They realized, some of them, not all of them, but a good portion of them, they realized that they had sinned by demanding that Pilate crucify him. You know, I could, I'm sure it was still ringing in some of their ears, crucify him, crucify him. And, and, and they felt very sorrowful, and they said, what shall we do? And Acts 2.38 is the answer. Then Peter said unto them, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so, he goes on in the next verse, and look at what it says. For the promise. We're talking about a promise made and a promise given. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That Holy Ghost experience that they experienced on the day of Pentecost was not just for that day. That's right. This is, but it's for you and your children, and, and as many are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Holy Ghost is an experience that God wants every believer to experience. And, you know, the, the Bible goes on to tell us that on that day, 3,000 Souls, Brad. Well, I'd love to preach a message to have 3,000 people. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we can't put limits on God. You just never know. Right. But uh, I just want to share this slide with you. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. Why do I need my own personal Pentecost? Well, one of the things I've already kind of let the cat out of that is the restoration of the, the communion that Adam and Eve had with God and we can have that own our own personal communion, our own relationship with the living God living within our hearts. And so it's it is God's manifestation. It's a promise of the Father. It is a gift, and I'm, we're not going to take time because we're we're running out of time to, to look at all the scriptures. But it is a gift of God. The Holy Spirit is a gift, and all you got to do to receive a gift is what? Reach out and receive it. Right? That's all you have to do by faith. Just receive it. And we talked about, we read the scripture about that God would send the comforter. And the Bible talks about that we're sealed by the Spirit. You know, God's seal is upon us. You know, uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, in ancient times, they put that wax seal on a document or on uh, something and put their uh, insignia in there to represent that that belonged to the king. You know, I'm thankful that I belong to the king of kings and the lord of lords. Yes, and, uh, you know, and it's a witness that he dwells within us and that he is in us. And when, why I received the Holy Spirit? Because it brings rest, peace, and joy. In fact, the scripture says that the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
And it gives us the power to be witnesses. We read that scripture. It teaches, guides, and shows us things to come. And uh, uh, the Bible says that he will lead us and guide us into all truth. He gives us power over the enemy. And, uh, you know, when before we knew Christ, before we had the Spirit of God in us, you know, all Satan had to do was just tempt us, right? You know, a lot of times he, he exhorted such... Uh, control over our lives, but we're free from that guy now yeah, right. because of the Spirit of God that dwells within us. You know, Jesus told a little parable, and I just happened to think of this. He talked about a man, you know, it's like a house with spirits in it, and, and, the, and the, you know, someone comes along and cleans up the house, and all the spirits are cast out. But then he makes an interesting point. He says, one of those spirits comes back. You know, or actually it was just one spirit that got kicked out. He comes back. He finds the place empty. Oh, it's all nice and clean and nobody's around. And he'll go get seven more and they'll, they'll all move in. And the, it says and the, the, the man's condition is worse than it, was, than it was before. You know, there's a lot of people that come to God. You know, they, they repent. They start going to church. But they never really receive the spirit. They never really... Uh, you know, walk with God. Well, what happens? A lot of times they quit coming, don't they? They you know, and and a lot of times they're worse off after they've had you know been to church and the, than when they first started because you can't leave that house empty. You got to have the Spirit of God. You know, you are not able in yourself to overcome Satan. You have to have the power of the Holy Ghost within you. Acts 19.2 says, And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now this is Paul passing through the upper coast of Ephesus, finds certain disciples. And, and he asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now that tells me something. You can be a believer and not have the Spirit of God. And I can't tell you whether you've got the Spirit of God or not. You have to be sincere in your own heart and say, do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Has he filled my heart with the Spirit? Have, am I experiencing the joy and the peace and the righteousness that God talks about? I, you know, I was, I was thinking about some songs that we sing, and I, I sometimes I wonder if people ever really realize what they're saying. How about this one? Heaven came down and glory filled Amen. my soul. Can you describe your experience like that? How about blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Talking about that witness that's in our life. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. There's another song, I don't know if you sing it around here, we used to sing it a lot at the church I went to, it says, It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of... You, ever, you heard that one? Some of you are nodding your head. Do we have that joy unspeakable? No, I'm not, I'm not going to say that you're always going to be a, you know, Christians, we, we experience life, but you know, some people, there's no bottom, right? But, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that, that when we have, you know, distressing times, that we have a net called the Holy Ghost that will keep us. And I find that even in the, my hardest times of my life, I'll still hear little songs in my heart, right. you know? Right. So, you know, God is good. Here's, a, here's another hymn. Fill my way every day with love. As I walk with the heavenly dove, let me go all the while with a song and smile. Fill my way every day with love. And so the question is, is, do you have the Holy Spirit? This is not a have-to situation. This is a get-to. Yeah. I tell you what, there's no... <laughs> You know, I, I, people run around, they're, they're, they're blasting their minds with drugs and trying to dull their senses with alcohol and trying to, you know, fill their lives with things and relationships, trying to find joy, trying to find happiness. And all they have to do is submit to God, bow down on an altar and receive God's 
spirit into their life. And last slide here. Luke 13, 11, 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them, to them that ask you? You know, all you got to do is ask. God wants you to have the Holy Ghost. All you have to do is bow down and surrender your life to Him. And make Him Lord of your life and He'll fill you with peace, He'll fill you with joy, He'll fill you with comfort, He'll fill you with righteousness. I tell you what, once you experience it, you're going to say, why did I wait so long? <laughs> Amen. Let's stand with